This tutorial is brought to you by one of the authors of Revising Professional Writing, now in its third edition. My students call me Dr. Kim. The publishers made this video available under a Creative Commons license. For more information, contact ParleyPress.com. Remember, you can use the pause button at any time, and if you see shadows or something weird on the screen, try changing your playback quality settings. The view you see here includes everything you might learn about professional writing in my tutorials. There are others that help you understand content development, organization, style, and mechanics, as well as the rhetorical context that determines which content, organization, or style is going to be effective in a specific situation. Although your primary interest in this tutorial is the message itself, effective bottom line placement can only be judged by taking into account the writer's purpose and audience. I should say I'm going to focus on addressing an audience from Western cultures. That's important because as readers, they place a high value on efficiency. I urge you to listen to the tutorials on rhetorical context, especially the one on audience. All right. This tutorial focuses on one area of organization in professional writing, bottom line placement. This idea is probably new to most of you. That's because bottom line placement is one of the most critical differences between academic and professional writing. My aim is to jumpstart your thinking about its impact in a business context and to explain specific techniques for placing the bottom line appropriately in your own writing will be considering the organization of an email update. The email was sent by a project manager of a construction company. I've revised it somewhat to make it more useful for our purposes. Remember the quality in the videos makes it really difficult to read on the screen. So if you're a student using our book, your instructor should have a copy, or you can always download one from prosewrite.com. The audience for this email is the owner of the company. Although he has plenty of expertise in construction, he isn't an expert on the specific project mentioned in this email. I mean, that's why he depends on the writer. The reader is somewhat skeptical of or sensitive to the writer's message about the cost overruns and schedule delays. I'm going to have more to say about that in this tutorial. For now, you should realize the writer has to increase the reader's readiness to accept the message in the update. In this tutorial, I will explain the three aspects involved in choosing where to place the bottom line within a message to be most successful. Hopefully, I'll also convince you that organizing successfully is important in this email update. You can only choose the best placement for the bottom line if you can identify what the bottom line is. So that's the first thing I'll cover here. Pause the recording, take a second to look at this passage which appears within the email update. Your task is to identify the bottom line message. Don't worry about how you would state that message to the reader yet. Just concentrate on identifying what it is. You should have recognized that you had to construct the bottom line yourself because it's not stated explicitly in this passage. Could it be Agate Beach Road site update? Well, that's an accurate description of the topic, but it's not really the bottom line. The bottom line has to convey the essential content of the email, not just its topic. That means your statement of the bottom line has to include an entire claim. Think both subject and predicate. Our first attempt here is made up only of a subject. How about this email contains an update on the Agate Beach Road site as the bottom line for this passage? This time the statement has a subject and a predicate, so it's a complete claim. But it still doesn't provide the reader with the essential content of the message. The reader still has to figure out what the status of work at the site actually is. And that's what the project update should do. To provide a complete but succinct bottom line for this passage, you could say the project at Agate Beach Road is slightly behind schedule and over budget. Now that is a statement of what the boss should know after reading the email. After you've identified the bottom line, you can begin thinking about how to state it for the reader. The first point is that with very few exceptions, the bottom line should be stated explicitly. A writer who leaves it up to the reader to construct the bottom line is taking a big chance. On the one hand, if readers care enough, 
they'll come up with their own bottom line. Unfortunately, theirs may not match the one intended by the writer. On the other hand, if readers don't care enough, they simply won't bother to figure out the bottom line at all. In either case, the writer's message is ineffective. Now I'll move on to predicting the audience's readiness to accept the bottom line message. That's the second thing you need to know. The tutorial on audience covers two aspects of readiness, including both knowledge and sensitivity. If you haven't listened to it yet, I encourage you to do so. In particular here, we're going to focus on the boss's sensitivity to the bottom line in the email update. Before we do that, though, I want to consider audience sensitivity to a few different messages stated very briefly. In one, the message, you've been hired, it's pretty easy to predict a positive reaction from the reader, right? Contrast that with five, you've been fired. Well, it's pretty easy to predict a negative reaction here. We can label this a sensitive message. Now consider three, interest rates dropped. We can predict not much reaction at all. It's a kind of neutral message. Now, of course, this depends on the specific reader. If the reader wants to borrow money, the reaction is more positive. If the reader wants to lend money, the reaction is probably more negative. Consider two, your team won. We can predict a positive reaction, but not as strongly positive as in one. Similarly, in four, your team lost. We can predict a negative reaction, but not as strongly negative as in five. The main difference is that the reader in five is the object of something individual in a non-routine situation. Readers are less sensitive to messages like four, which are less personal and more routine. The point here is that in Western cultures, the vast majority of readers are highly sensitive only to bottom lines which are extremely negative. That means personal and unique. This fact is why the bottom line should be stated explicitly for a Western audience, regardless of their moderate sensitivity to it. This fact is also critical in determining where to place the bottom line of a message. I'll say more about that in just a second. First, let's return to the construction boss's sensitivity to the bottom line about project delays and cost overruns in the email update we were talking about. How negative is that message? Would you say it's more like four, your team lost, or five, you've been fired? The bottom line in the email, while it does involve the reader, is not personal. Furthermore, Additional expenses and scheduled delays must be somewhat routine in the construction industry. Your success as a professional writing to Western readers depends on your ability to recognize that the message is more like four and that the boss is not likely to be highly sensitive to the bottom line. All right, the next thing you need to know is that there are two possible placements for the bottom line of a message. The bottom line can be placed at the beginning that's called direct organization, or it can be placed somewhere else. Middle or end doesn't matter, but it's called indirect organization or placement. In Western organizations, the default choice for all professional writing is direct placement. That's because it creates a more efficient message. Depending on how much the reader cares about the message, the first few lines of a document may sometimes be all that's immediately read, with the remainder of the message simply serving as a record that can be revisited if needed in the future. So putting the bottom line within those first few lines means it's easy for readers to get the essential message and to determine whether they need to keep reading right away. The majority of Western professionals want an inefficient message only when the bottom line is extremely negative, like five on the previous slide. That means your fired warrants indirect organization, but your team loss does not. Let's return once more to the email update. The revised version that you see here now includes an explicit bottom line. Is that bottom line placement direct or indirect? Well, the fact that it doesn't appear in the first sentence or two means the writer has used indirect placement. Now the question is, is indirect placement warranted here? 
Well, we already noted that while the boss is likely to be somewhat sensitive to the bottom line about the added expense and scheduled delay in the project, he's not going to be highly sensitive. In this situation, it's best to assume the reader will prefer the efficiency of direct organization in the document. That can be accomplished quite easily by moving the bottom line statement just after the first sentence of the passage. You must be able to accurately predict reader sensitivity to determine what type of content, informative or persuasive, is needed and also to choose the best placement for your bottom line. Note that we're talking about reader sensitivity. As the writer, you may be sensitive about the content of your message for any number of reasons, but your own sensitivity is irrelevant. Now it's time to check your understanding of bottom line placement by revising a passage you haven't seen before. The question here asks that you identify the bottom line, state how it's currently organized, and whether that organization is effective. This passage comes from a memo to residents of a condo building. Of the content that appears in this passage, I think the sentence labeled 5 is the best candidate for the bottom line. While the writer wants to provide residents with information, the memo will be a success only if residents actually move their belongings. So, the primary purpose is one of directing rather than informing. The fact that sentence 5 appears near the end of the passage means the writer has used indirect organization. But the bottom line here is not personal or unique, so I think the residents are not likely to be highly sensitive to the message. That means direct organization would be more effective. To revise, sentence 5 should appear as the first or second sentence of the memo. The three aspects of bottom line placement have been discussed by referring to an email written for a boss who is somewhat unable and unwilling to accept the writer's message about a project's status. Revising to make the bottom line of the passage explicit is critical in creating an effective message because without it, the reader might have interpreted the status of the project differently than the writer intended. Identifying the primary purpose of a professional writer's message is directly connected to the bottom line. Revising to make the bottom line of the passage direct was critical in creating an efficient message. Most experienced students have difficulty using direct organization because it's contrary to their experience in academic writing. Please remember that when teachers serve as readers, they tend to prefer indirect or inductive organization, where you list all your supporting claims and facts before giving the conclusion, or what we would call the bottom line. They do that because teachers are usually more interested in the supporting claims and facts. And teachers are actually required to read what their students write. In contrast, when professionals read, they tend to prefer direct or deductive organization, where the bottom line comes before the supporting detail. That's because they're most interested in the conclusion, or the bottom line itself, and they want to get the information they need to do their job as efficiently as possible. If you can apply the content of this chapter in your own writing, trust me, you'll be a highly valued professional in the workplace. Before I end this tutorial on bottom line placement, it's important to remind you I've assumed an audience of people from Western cultures. Aside from tone, there's no aspect of professional writing that's more highly influenced by culture than bottom line placement. This is further evidence that successful professional writers adapt, in other words, strategically manage their organization based on knowledge of their audience. The key is to use direct bottom line placement unless you know your reader will judge your message as negative, personal, and non-routine. Good organization ensures not only the effectiveness of a professional writer's message, but also the efficiency with which his or her readers will get that message. Not surprisingly, Western workplace audiences appreciate efficiency. There's no way to learn to write your own workplace documents successfully without actually applying the ideas in this tutorial as you read and analyze new documents that you see. Remember, reading thoughtfully precedes writing successfully.